series, and, and um, so we have this uh, opportunity to, to take the conversation uh, forward and sideways, up and down in, in interesting ways. And um, for me, it's very exciting to have Hilton here because, uh, firstly, Hilton was one of my teachers when I was an undergrad at UCT when he was a graduate student at Chicago. Uh, and uh, so he's been a long time friend and colleague and a uh, great admirer of his thinking and his writing. So um, it's, it's just really wonderful for me personally, but I think all of us uh, have read Hilton's work. I know a lot of my, st my students all of your work, so, um, uh, so people are very far more familiar with your work around um, sacrifice and ritual and kinship. Um, and, Positive to tell, but um, let me just summarize by saying that um, uh, Hilton finished his PhD in Chicago in 2001. Um, and he had a postdoc there, a Harvard Schmidt Fellow, at the Royal Arts College of Chicago until 2005. And then he taught at the New School for Social Research in New York uh, for a few years and then joined Wits University in 2010. And, uh, he's just finished a stint at the head of the department and is now currently working on a book. Uh, I think it's called The Difficult Dead. Uh, we'd love to get more about that at some point. So, um, so if, there, if anyone's interested in, in uh, a flyer, there's a couple more flyers. You can send those around uh, for the rest of the seminar series. Please take them and pass it on. And, um, uh, sorry, I forgot exactly the title for today. So, uh, uh, in fact, I don't even have it up here. So you'll have to just, uh, Explain to us the materiality of marriage plans. <laughs> 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 That's so, what I get for not getting into it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, you know, we're very excited uh, from your abstract and the readings that you've sent to us. Um, you've opened up already a very suggestive space for, for a whole set of questions, which we're very excited to get into with you. So um, thanks very much for coming and uh, giving the space 40, 45 minutes as you wish or less. And we'll have, open it up for discussion, another 30, 40 minutes for discussion. Uh, and then for those of you who want to stay and uh, join our more informal reading group, we'll have about a 15, 20 minute break after the seminar and then around three, was before three, we'll gather in the room next door, 406, uh, where we'll have some refreshments and everyone's welcome to join to that. Um, you don't have to have read the readings, which we send out, but we will better if you have. Um, and we can continue the conversation in more detail then. So I think we'll just hand over and uh, take you up as you wish. See you first. Okay. okay, thanks very much for coming. No, thank you very much, Thomas, and thank you to everyone in the department and the Index and the Human Team for uh, bringing me down and putting me up in such style. I can't believe the retirement here. Um, I just put a picture of it on Facebook looking out of what used to be Kiesa's office. Um, and I also got put up in fantastic style last night at a lovely guest house, but I'm afraid that my response to not having to share a bed with my wife and my two-year-old daughter was not to get a good night's sleep, but to have a fit of insomnia. <laughs> so if I seem a bit slow, please forgive me for that. Um, I'm probably going to speak for closer to 30, 35 minutes rather than 45. The paper uh, I'm giving is very much a work in progress. Um, it's something that I'm currently busy expanding from a short conference presentation into a full-length article, which is going into a collection on marriage in Southern Africa. Um, so it would be very useful to have feedback. This is the perfect time to be using feedback on this because it's very much uh, about to take form as a full-length paper. Okay, so as Thomas said, um, the paper is called The Materiality of Marriage Payments. Please figure me out. I'm going to read it. I'm very old style with this. Uh, I don't have anything fancy to show you. Um, I'm just going to sort of read, but hopefully slowly and carefully enough that uh, it doesn't seem too boring. Um, okay, the paper is called The Materiality of Marriage Payments. There are two things I want to do in this talk. The first of these is to try in a way to complicate a narrative that's now become accepted as something of an orthodoxy across the field of Southern African studies, and especially in anthropology. That narrative concerns the decline of marriage as an institution organizing social life, as well as the structure of the life course in South African communities. We all know how this goes in the context of large-scale socio-economic changes beginning in the 70s and including the decline of the forms of industrial labor embedded in the economy of apartheid, marriage has now become an institution out of the reach of most adults. The causal links are multiple and complex, but among them are of course some directly economic ones, including the very high cost, the very high monetary cost of bride wealth and increasingly the high cost of weddings and other preceding ceremonies. And this has, of course, led 
to notable shifts in the organization of social life, including the rise of the matrifocal household and the redefinition of forms of gendered identity in many important ways. When I say I want to complicate this narrative, let me be very clear that I do not mean to contest it. The evidence is all too clear that a radical shift has taken place, and I find it borne out in my own research in Northern KwaZulu Natal, where the ethnographic material for my talk today is set. I still think there's a danger, though, that in taking on board our awareness of this massive change, we might in fact be eliding some important ambiguities. <laughs> Since Komarov and others wrote on the issue in the 70s and 80s, we've known, of course, that marriage in many Southern African social contexts is not an either-or status or the result of a single event, but rather a long-term process of becoming. So what happens when we read this important insight back against our idea that marriage has lost its significance as a social institution? When we say that marriage has lost its importance, what understanding of marriage are we invoking? I'd like to suggest that if we keep in mind the classical view of Southern African marriage as process, then we're forced to take account of the social importance of something that drops out of view if marriage is treated either as fully accomplished status or as nothing. We're forced, that is, to take account of the vast proliferation of attempted beginnings, of courtships, of the final transactions that stop and start and stall and mostly go nowhere. Well, actually not nowhere, really, because even if they don't lead to marriage in full, in the end, as it were, they're still deeply consequential in the ordering and the representation of social life. They have many important effects, and these are what we tend to leave out of view when we talk about the decline of marriage as if the social significance of the institution lay only in the fullness of its accomplishment rather than in the attempting of it, in the hazarding of affinity against the material odds. The way I'd like to get at this kind of consequentiality of partial or unfinished or final relationships is the second aim of my talk. I'd like to do this by trying to model how it is that partial affinity gathers social consequence in the context of domestic life in rural northern Brazil and Natal, <coughs> where I've been doing ethnographic research on and off for the last 20 years. I'm particularly struck here by the roles of marriage payments, a term I use to incorporate not just bride wealth, but the multitude of associated gifts and transactions that flow in both directions in the course of constructing affinity. Again, I take inspiration here from Komarov, who moved us beyond the legalistic formalism of older structural functionless models of bride wealth by insisting on the role of marriage payments in providing forms of evidence for the existence of relationships. The key move Komarov made in that regard was to shift attention away from the formal or legal definition of relationships towards the formal or legal definition of relationships towards the ways relationships are recognized in informal and often contested ways as importantly as informal ones. <clears throat> I want to bring that focus on recognition to bear on an understanding of how marriage payments come to be consequential in Northern Kwazulu Natal, whether they are paid in full or not. To do this, I turned to some recent theoretical work by Lambeck, Michael Lambeck, on the question of the value of performative acts. Lambeck's main idea here is to suggest that performative acts acquire value by way of being recognized by an audience. In other words, the measure of an action is the way in which it has moved the minds of others. Lambeck compares and contrasts this to a materialist understanding of the way that labor congeals value in objects. And in this regard, I actually want to take some distance from his account of value theory. As I hope to show, it's precisely the material or the sensuous dimensions of marriage payments that enable their representational effectiveness. But I agree with Lambeck's insistence on the importance of recognition as a value form, a value form that stands in a relationship of difference from the kind of value we talk about when we talk about the valuation of objects as commodities. My argument is that the sensuous performance of the final transactions constitutes a material figuration of kinship. This is not a one-dimensional institutional architecture, though. Different kinds of marriage payments bring different aspects of kinship into view. And in doing so, they bring persons into view as well as participants in these relationships. They do so in front of an audience, 
an audience that comprises both the living, but very importantly, also the dead. And this is how they gather social consequence. Whether or not they come to a sort of completion in the end, they propel themselves through this audience into the future, where they have many kinds of effects in the organization of human experience. So this first section is called Unfinished Business. Everyone agrees by now that the main thing to say about marriage in Southern Africa is the fact of its decline. In Northern Pazulu Natal, the number of women over the age of 50 who had never been married quadrupled in a three decades stretching from 1970 to 2001. And the number of unmarried men of the same age very nearly doubled during that period. This is the force of census information that's related in a paper by Hosgood and others in 2009. If these are the kinds of trends we see for people past middle age, what do the numbers look like when we look at younger people? The same paper reports that in one rural district close to Mtuba Tuba, in one rural district close to Mtuba Tuba in 2006, only 30% of women between the ages of 30 and 34 had ever been married, while the rate for men belonging to the same cohort was a vanishing 10%. These figures showed steady increases as progressively older cohorts were sampled, but this did not mean that people were simply deferring marriage to later ages. For most cohorts, the figures showed that the numbers of people of any age who had ever been married were also declining progressively year by year. Nor is there any reason to think that this is a picture unique to the specific area where the research was done. The broader trend is attested to in a large array of social science literature focusing on areas across South and Southern Africa now. And although I've done, not done any systematic quantitative work on the question myself, my own long-term experience of social life in two other rural communities in Northern Pozzuolo Natal bears out the same pattern. This shift has of course had numerous, now very well documented effects on the organization of social relationships, as well as on the structure of the life course and the kinds of ethical judgments brought to bear on people's assessments of the path of human development. In the case of Pazulu Natal, Mark Hunter's work on marriage and masculinity is one of the best known scholarly expositions of these trends. As Hunter shows us through careful historical arguments, the meanings and ethical values that are associated with masculine love and courtship have changed quite dramatically since the period of high industrial, apartheid, high apartheid industrial labor in a context marked increasingly by unemployment, precariousness, and widening inequality. Where courtship was once understood as part of a process leading to marriages, in which men were supposed to be working providers for their families, and where men were judged irresponsible if they courted without that intent, now it is much more often the case, Hunter argues, that courtship is conducted without expectation of futurity. The irresponsible man now is not the man who courts without meaning to wed, but the man who is completely indiscriminate in his choice of sexual partners. And the increasing absence of marriage as a passage in the structure of the life course is of course matched by fundamental changes in social organization as well, most notably in the rise of matrifocality as the dominant form of domestic composition. But what happens, as I've suggested, when we read this transformation against something else, we have also known for a long time now from the literature on marriage in the Southern African region. That is to say, against the fact that in many social contexts here, marriage is regarded as an ongoing process of realization rather than as an event. As Komarov says in one classic account of the issue, Swana marriage is not a state of being into which people enter through one performance. Instead, it is constructed over time through a long-term process of becoming more and more married. This is a process that may even extend past death, as bridewell's payments and other kinds of requirements continue to be met on behalf of decedents by their kin. Most importantly for my purposes here, this also means that in practice, it's very difficult to distinguish marriage as such from what Kovarov calls, quote, other less approved types of union. Discussing ethnographic work by Simon Roberts, Komarov says that Swine marriage, quote, is flexible, inhering ultimately in recognition on the part of kin and community, rather than in procedural or jural formality. I've found very much the same in my own work in contemporary Pazulu Natal. 
On the face of it, this is surprising, given the many differences that exist between the two contexts. Komarov makes much of the fact that Swana preferences for cousin marriage introduce inevitable ambiguities and multiple possibilities when it comes to the designation of kin as agnates or as affines. He says that this indeterminacy is one of the major spurs to the constantly ongoing renegotiation of the status of any relationship over time. The absence of cousin marriage in Kwazulu Natal, by contrast, makes the division of agnates from affines clear as day. In the regional history of customary law, there are also important differences that date back to the statutory codification of Zulu customary law in the course of the 19th century, including the famous Shepstonian innovation of a prescribed and definite limit to the quantity of cattle paid as bride was, 11 in the case of commoners. This puts an eventual terminus onto the passage of bride was, making the situation rather different from that of Sutu and Swana marriages, where it's commonly said that bride was is never finished. Despite these important differences, there are nonetheless many practical grounds in Kwazulu Natal for the manifestation of much the same kind of informal indeterminacy that Komarov noted. Official customary law, of course, is very clear on what makes marriage, including above all the passage of an agreed quantity of cattle paid as bride wealth. It also very clearly distinguishes bride wealth payments from other kinds of transactions with prospective affluence. To take one classic example, the payment of bride wealth, ilobolo, is categorically different under customary law from the payment of inflaulo, a penalty for impregnation by which a man acknowledges paternity of a child born to a woman outside of marriage. In practice, though, things are much more flexible. The payment of inflaulo is in many cases a dead-end transaction, the relationship between the parents often not enduring past the pregnancy. But in some cases, a man who has paid in Tlaulo might go on to begin the process of transacting bride wealth as well. In every such case that I've encountered, though I'm sure there are exceptions, the monetary or cattle wealth that was paid as in Tlaulo is retrospectively redesignated as an element of the overall bride wealth, despite the distinction in custom real, official custom real. What is more, and this is the main point to which I've been moving, that same potentiality for retrospective conversion, for retrospective redesignation, also seems to be built prospectively into the ways that people organize, reorganize their relationships and reorganize their terms of address once any kind of a final payment is made. Once a man has started the process of paying bride wealth, people very widely start referring to him as the husband, the quenyana of the woman concerned. His in-laws begin to call him Sibali, the person who counts cattle for them. When he goes to his prospective affine's homestead, it's said he's going in Zimi, to his in-laws' home. When the woman in question visits him at his own home, people there call him Makoti, or bride. I know of several instances where all this is the case, even though in fact in Tlaulo is the only payment that's been made within the context of the relationship. Similarly, the payment of a promissory sum of money is Tembiso, is sometimes sufficient grounds for a man to ask his affines to allow their daughter to live with him provisionally, especially if they have children together. No one ever forgets, of course, that work still has to be done, that much still has to move before the status of the relationship is put beyond any doubt. With the status of that relationship to come before a customary or other court, the payment of Inflaulo would be extremely unlikely to grant a man recognition as a husband in that formal legal setting. But none of this knowledge prevents most people from extending somewhat less formal recognition to partial unions, effectively in much the same terms by which they extend it to those who've actually gone through all the steps that might formally constitute a marriage, whatever those might be. In contemporary Kwazulu Natal, this all becomes important for two main reasons of context. First of all, meeting all the requirements of bride wealth payments, as well as other associated transactions, as well as the costs of the several kinds of public ceremonial events involved in marriage, this is a task that challenges even fairly comfortable middle-class families. Even for those who are in fact able to pass all these hurdles, doing so takes a very long time sometimes more than a decade. 
For those who are less fortunate, which is to say for most people living in rural Kwazulu Natal, the process often stalls because there are simply insufficient means to continue. The effective recognition of a partial union grants some kind of dignity to couples who find themselves in this tough predicament. And this is something Mark Hunter has actually begun to write on more recently with regards to working in Blasi. But this is only provisionally the case, because once transactions stall for an extended length of time, that very fact creates tensions in the relationship between a man and his affines, and that in turn puts a stress on his relationship with his partner, not infrequently leading to its collapse. My admittedly only anecdotal experience is that the strength with which a union is recognized by affines and others depends not so much on how much has been paid, but rather on the sense that things are in motion, that payments of whatever kind and size are being made and can be expected to continue. The second reason is closely related. Stall bright wealth payments are far from being the only reason relationships collapse, of course. Infidelity, geographical distance, and other factors, not to mention the overall precariousness of so many sites to social life in this part of the world, all of these make for mired and abandoned ties as well. Add to this the fact that people move on to new relationships alongside or in place of ones that are stuck, as well as the fact that relationships can always be reactivated, even when abandoned. Put this all together and an extraordinarily complex picture emerges. While from one perspective, the narrative we all know, marriage rates are declining, from another perspective, affinity in fact proliferates. Fewer and fewer people might be married in fact in full, however we would actually define that, but more and more people are octopus-like engaged in multiple states of partial union, more or less accomplished, more or less in motion, more or less stalled. Now, if not in law, given that they fall short of its requirements, then how do these relationships acquire force and reality? They do so, in my experience, by being measured and narrated through accounts of the unfolding transaction of gifts between sets of affines. In other words, alongside being at the center of a proliferation of more or less active or final ties, people are also the focal points of multiple unfinished histories of transaction. What then is the afterlife of all those stalled or abandoned marriage payments? including bright wealth, but also a wide array of other prestations. How could we include them in our account of the supposed decline of marriage? And how could we use this in order to illuminate questions of efficacy surrounding this type of action? How do transacted valuables become a part of what Komarov called the unofficial recognition, extended to a relationship, quote, by kin and by community? The way I would like to get at this is by way of a Zulu idiom, one that goes, isn't komazi akuluma, the cattle are speaking. The cattle in question are bright wealth, and the time space in which cattle speak this way, bright wealth cattle speak this way, is one in which the motion towards marriage has stalled. People use this idiom in contexts where a relationship collapses after a man has paid at least part or even all of the bright wealth demanded by his in-laws. Once bride wealth has been paid, sufficiently expected that, as mandated by the customary law, any children born to a relationship will be taken in as members of the father's umuzi or homestead and gathered under the ancestors of that family. In practice, though, it's very common for children to stay with their mother's families instead, especially where that woman's ties to their father have been broken off or dissipated. If anything goes awry in the life of such a child, that's when it's said that the cattle are speaking, and cattle speak in the language of misfortune. Listen to the following conversation in which two women explain the concept to me. Mum Temple. Now that child, if it comes to, maybe he's looking for work. Mum Yeza, nothing goes right. Mum Temple, he fails to find it. Maybe he wants to be married, nothing is possible. Mum Yeza, the ancestors are crying at home. I'm telling you the cattle are crying, the cattle are speaking, because they went over there, but now he hasn't come back here yet. He stays over there with the cattle. Mam Yeza, he's needed at home. Mam Tembu, he's needed here at home. The cattle are speaking in that child. These women were not addressing either a rare or a hypothetical scenario. 
In my own work, I've recorded many cases where the children of a stalled or blocked relationship have come to suffer misfortunes that are explained in terms of their not being reunited, either residentially or through proper ritual procedure with the homesteads of their agnates. Whether there is bride wells at issue or not, the sense is that their ancestors are demanding them and that this is what's causing them trouble. So let us unpack the ontology of this bovine communication. First of all, we should take note of the classically Mosian scheme, of course, according to which such cattle act as extensions, both in space and in time, of the substance and of the motivated action of the family that's paid them. For cattle to cry over there is just the same as for ancestors to be crying here as well. And just as in most, by speaking over there, the animals draw attention not just to the establishment of a connection between two homesteads, but also simultaneously to the subsequent interruption and the unbalancing of that connection. The problem is that circulation has stalled. Reciprocity has not yet been established through return. Life and blood have been given up in the form of right wealth cattle, but life and blood have not yet been restored in the form of children. But beyond this obvious most point, I would also like to interpret this understanding of relationships by turning now to Lambeck and to an argument that he's recently made on the value of performative acts. Lambeck's argument synthesizes a wide range of conceptual inspirations, from speech act theory to most and Marx. But the core of it is based on Hannah Arendt's Aristotelian distinction between work, which according to Arendt is directed at the world of things, and action, which is directed at the realm of persons and human relationships. To this, Lambic adds a quite traditional and abbreviated Marxist account of how it is that objects come to have values. In this view, which Lambic ascribes to Marx, their value is a kind of congelation, that is, of the labor that's gone into their material production. Through the process of circulation in markets, the results of that human industry are able to come free from the labor process and to move almost independently through circuits of commodified exchange. If this is the way that value is created in the realm of work and things, then the question Lambert poses is whether we can plausibly identify an analogous sort of process in the realm of action directed at other people, in the realm not of material production per se, but rather that of ethics, politics, aesthetics, ritual, and so forth. He argues that we can. If productive labor congeals value in objects, then performative action, he says, also congeals more or less enduring representations of itself, now within the minds and in the subsequent acts of an audience that's made up of other persons, persons who are able to recognize, to recollect, to pass judgment on, and ultimately to respond to such acts with others. Value thus lies in what Lambert calls the consequentiality of action its relative ability to move the minds of others and to transmit itself thereby into subsequent chains of action and interaction. Let me say parenthetically that I hesitate over some of Lambeck's scaffolding of his argument. Iron's distinction of work from action and also of labor from work, which Lambeck does not pursue, this distinction seems to me to naturalize as what Iron, of course, termed the human condition, something that's actually a very specific historical condition a historical condition specific to the development of capitalism, where the ethical and the economic dimensions of human activity are cleaved from each other and governed by logics that cannot translate across what then appears as a divide between domains, a radical divide between domains. I'm also unsure to some extent of Lambeck's account of the notion of congelation in Marx, which seems to me too positivistic to capture what I think is Marx's own more subtle and nuanced account of a dialectical social system where action comes to be represented as value. So I think there is still a lot of theoretical work to be done here. Nonetheless, I'm taken with the main conclusion that Lambert wants to put before us. The idea that is, that a dialectical value theory might be brought to bear on understanding performative actions such as rituals, prestations, sacrifices, and so forth. And that it is the consequentiality of action, its afterlife, that a move of this kind could illuminate. You might ask what the value is, as it were, of bringing the notion of value itself to bear on this. Here I agree with Lambeck again that one of the core phenomena identified by Marxian value theory is the way that value forms a representation of action 
that outlasts the limited space time of the performance of that action. These representations circulate into other places and other times, allowing people to measure, assess, and respond to them by inserting them into subsequent actions as well. In other words, what value theory illuminates is the enchainment of action in social processes spanning different places and different moments. Coming back to my own immediate purposes, I'm taken with Lambeck's major claim precisely because it seems to me to cast a powerful light on what is going on in the transaction of marriage payments in, the places, like, in places like the ones where I've done fieldwork. Let me elaborate by turning again to the idiom of speaking that's often used here to point to the passing of judgment, as in the example I've just given of the speaking of Bridewell's cattle. Given the extraordinarily high cost of marriage payments, and the fact that this is a large part of what makes marriage unattainable despite people's best intentions and desires, I've often asked people why there's no corresponding move to put greater limits on the requirement. People tend to answer in two directions. One addresses, of course, the greed of their in-laws, and no doubt this is a factor of great importance. But the other answer I almost uniformly receive is that, quote, they would be speaking, or they would speak. In such instances, the they that's referred to here are specifically the spirits of the family dead. Once again, the language in which they would speak is that of misfortune. If marriage payments cease to be made, the dead would withdraw protection and strength from the living. But why would they do so? Because they have criteria. They're accustomed to, quote, seeing, and people often say, quote, hearing, the acts of making such marriage payments. Having seen and heard such acts performed at their homesteads in the past, did they expect the same acts to be repeated in the future? They continue to judge the acts of the living according to the criteria with which they're familiar. In other words, they constitute an audience for action, and in doing so, they make it consequential. They give it effect. The difficulty, as I've written elsewhere, is that the dead are so difficult. They have exceedingly exact and strict expectations as to what actually constitutes action of the right and recognizable kind. They're also often liable to misrecognize acts that do not meet their standards and formulations. The result is that it is necessary to take great care to present one's acts in the clearest, most explicit, and most recognizable way through performances in front of them. To illustrate this, let me quickly rehearse just one example, a case which I've discussed in another regard in a previous paper. Some years ago, I met an elderly woman who was about to be married. The ceremony was unusual in that her husband, with whom she had in fact lived a long adult life, was already dead. In fact, she had already married him many years before in her youth, or so she had thought. At the time, she was in love with another man, and when her father found out about this affair, he was worried that she would elope, and that he would have to return the bright wealth cattle that his family had already received from her husband-to-be. So he bundled her off in a hasty wedding to seal the matter. One consequence of this haste was that he did not give her a wedding chest to take with her. I don't have time now, I've done so in another paper, to go through the semiotic properties of this item, the wedding chest. But the point is that it anchors a maternal domain encapsulated in marriage within a broader agnatic homestead. It's one of the key devices through which a woman is made visible as wife. And wedding processions tend to focus a great deal of public activity on marking its spatial passage from a woman's natal homestead to the one where she's married. In this case, even though something like half a century had passed away in the meantime, a set of misfortunes in recent years had pointed back to the absence of this wedding chest. In its absence, it was now being said, the ancestors of her husband's home were unable to see her within the final light, and thus they withheld their protection from her house. In order to put this right, she had to return to her family of birth and retrace her past steps back to her marital home, chest in hand. The importance of effective performance also helps to explain a characteristic of many accounts that I've collected of the range of transactions and ceremonies that go into making a marriage here. In addition to the careful laying out of steps and materials, what stands out about such accounts is their own very vivid performativity. When talking about an act such as a prestation, a marriage payment, people often vividly, with their mouths or with their bodily motions, offer an iconic representation of the actual sensuous qualities of the act they are describing. 
If the act at issue is striking a metal dish, people will often reproduce the sound that this would make. If it is dressing a person, they might reenact the sweep of the arms with which a jacket or a blanket is laid around someone's body. They might modulate their voices to match the pitch and the pace of the way they would speak when engaged in such action. The scripts for practice have this kind of vividness, I think, because what is most, what is most at issue in such types of acts is the task of making sure that they are in fact seen and heard, that they lodge themselves securely in the minds of both the living and the dead who constitute their audience and give them their effectivity, their consequences in subsequent social process. This also means that effective action depends upon a whole sensuous ecology of constructed space and assembled sounds and smells and things, all of which gather an audience and focus it upon the difficult work of ritual reception, the reception of ritual performance. This concrete materiality of performative action is something that I think Lambert overlooks to some extent. Perhaps this is because of his Austinian reading of speech acts as the categorical instance of performative activity. And here again, too, his Arendtian distinction between the world of things and the world of persons seems overdrawn and insufficiently motivated in socio-historical terms. Ironically, if Lambert were to make more of the sensuous material dimensions of performative acts, he could also contrast this more subtly to the abstraction of action in labor. Nonetheless, his reading of the afterlives and actions through the audiences seems to me to capture very well the dynamics of what is at play in the transaction of marriage payments here. If they are successful, though, what is it that these acts of prestation achieve within the minds of their audiences, both living and dead? What I would like to argue is that the content of these acts is the work of making persons visible as participants in a spatially located set of relationships. To demonstrate the point, let me discuss very briefly just the two main kinds of payments that affines require from a husband and his family in the course of transacting a marriage. In Northern Portugal Natal, most commonly, bride wealth on the one hand, and a set of gifts that go by the name Isibizo on the other, or things that are called for, as it were, costs. As Hunter notes, citing a paper by Bradford from 1927, Isibizo had a contested historical pedigree. They caught up with the colonial imposition of limits to bride wealth in KwaZulu Natal, being additional items that affines demanded in order to circumvent those limits. Whatever their origination, however, they've made themselves into a structural and symbolic pair to bride wealth pro proper. And it is in this light that I discuss them here. Both bride wealth and Isibizo do much more than simply authorize a relationship by transferring wealth from one set of kin to another. They also refer to a complex set of institutional forms, thus presenting images of what a homestead is as a social fact. At the center, of course, of this process of representation is the transfer of bride wealth property, lobol. Whether it is transacted in money or cattle, bride wealth is framed as the vehicle for a bond joining groups of agnates, each of these groups defined by its collective patrilineal descent. In other words, the homestead that comes into view in bride wealth is in one respect the domain of a corporate patriarchy, contrasted with other such entities but relatively homogeneous within itself and identified with the ancestry of its senior male members. Even as that bride wealth is transferred, however, other kinds of institutional forms come into view. If bride wealth comes as cattle, the mother of the bride might land a blow on the back of each animal as it enters the kraal of the homestead using either a carrying sling for infants or a belt that's tied around the stomach after pregnancy. The bellowing of the animals when they're beaten this way alerts agnatic ancestors to their arrival. When marriages are in trouble, people sometimes link this anecdotally to the transaction of bride wealth exclusively in money, since no one beats a banknote, and money thus presents the danger of circulating in silence, leading ancestors out of the constitution of relationships. All the more, then, it's striking that it is wives rather than agnates who are responsible for eliciting that bellowing, that oral representation. The act of hitting bride wealth cattle with girdles or slings makes a fold in time to link the arrival of bride wealth back to expenditures of arduous and painful reproductive action by women. And in so doing, it brings into view the existence of another domain 
the maternal house as an element of a homestead that now appears different as a result of this, not just a simply agnatic space, but rather as a complexly differentiated and layered social space, including the final and matrilateral elements. The set of gifts called Easy Bees will usually follow Bridewell's, but differ from that, differ from it, in that they present it not to a homestead as such, but rather to its individual members, by virtue of the specific ties of kinship that relate them differentially to the bride, as siblings, parents, and so on. Here it is the web of bilateral kinship that comes into view instead of agnatic unity. But once again, the maternal house provides the semiotic grounds for this image of relatedness. These abysal gifts come in many forms, depending on the gender, age, and wishes of the recipients. They can include suits, bicycles, stoves, and so on. But each gift comes in a bundle, including a sleeping mat and a blanket. And the act of presenting these items puts the recipients in the spotlight as the subjects of attentive care directed and enacted by the women of the final home. Ritualistically, the recipients are fed, clothed, and put to sleep before they dance to show their joy and their pride in front of others. The same thing happens when gifts move in the opposite direction, from bridal party to individual relatives of the husband. In this light, then, the circulation of marriage payments represents the final bond as an interlocking, <coughs> not of two agnatic holes only, but also and rather of two networks of extended kin, related through the care of women and affines. At the one extreme, then, Bridewell gives an image of the homestead as an agnatic singularity. At the other extreme, gifts like Easy Beasel stage the relatedness of many different persons as the subjects of the reproductive activities of affines. Taken as a whole, the complex system of marriage prestations does, as I've said, not simply transfer wealth, does so on a range of different vectors simultaneously. Each of these brings persons into view beneath a different kind of light, and each of them has different implications for the disposition of valuables. In other words, marriage payments construe a home complexly as a space of recognition. They simultaneously perform representations of the person and of the home through which that person is related to others. To conclude then, this is how the range of marriage payments have their consequences. They render persons visible in a particular light, especially to the audience of the dead. If this is not done convincingly or not at all, that audience fails to recognize and protect the persons in question. On the other hand, if the chain of action is broken, the afterlife of the act also falls out of line with the impression it's made on the minds of the dead. And that evokes their anger and their confusion just as powerfully. Think of the misfortune inflicted on children when there is unrequited right loss. Both of these scenarios are all too common in rural Quasil and Natal at present in the kind of context outlined at the beginning of this talk. The proliferation of partial connections is a process that has consequences because even when the futures of those connections are abandoned, their pasts continue to have great interpersonal effect. Thank you very much. Right, thanks, Hilton. That was an absolutely masterful analysis and um, bringing back into view something which is very, very difficult to think about in anthropology beyond South Africa, but particularly in South Africa. So, uh, thank you for bringing those concerns together. Um, I've got a number of questions for you, but let's um, open it up for discussion and uh, we can take it in groups of a uh, couple of questions at a time, uh, if you like, or one at a time. Yeah, One at a time is probably easier. Okay, we can, we can do that unless we're going to run out of time. Um, so, is anybody who wants to kick us off? Let me start with a question. Um, uh, you, you spoke at the right at the end about um, the conjoining of networks of extended kin by means of the care that women perform. And uh, so, uh, and then you spoke about the proliferation of partial connections, which seems like a sort of a Strathurian kind of moment of, um, you know, we have to think not only about this empirical complexity, but also in anthropology, how are we thinking about these kinds of questions? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, they're not all or nothing, they're not, uh, simply struct structural elements that you want to pay attention to the ordinary efforts that happen in the course of everyday life. 
Uh, and so in the course of everyday life, something is happening which puts pressure on, on say, uh, kind of, uh, uh, received notions of circulation or structuration. So, um, so the, the, the big problem that I have that I want to ask you is, is your, Chris, your criticism of Lambic seems to turn on his suggestion that the performative action rests on moving the minds of others as opposed to some other kind of more material effect. And um, I think you're right in terms of that argument of Lambic theory invoking, and yet it seems that with the, the term that Lambic is trying to use, so it's Austrian performative speech act theory, uh, I'm not sure that it depends utterly on merely moving the minds of others. That uh, in thinking about the felicity conditions in which a performative speech act gains force, that therein lies actually the space for um, seeing a full range of, of material arrangements that must be in place for that so-called speech act to take, for, to take effect. So it's not limited simply to the minds of others, merely through language. So it's a question of how we interpret uh, speech act theory. Is it simply about words being uttered by means of mouths, or uh, can we extend that to think in material terms? So, a bunch of kind of questions in there, but you don't have to take up any of those other ones of those. Uh, wondering. Well, let me give it a try. I mean, I, I agree with the instincts, the materialist instincts behind that reading in Boston. Um, I think, and, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if I, if I put it that way, I, I should correct that. I wouldn't say that my criticism of that is specifically on the question of actually moving the minds of others, but rather how that's reading, and the fact that it depends on, on precisely the sensuous ecology of communication um, that uh, I feel drops out of view in his argument, perhaps because of the way he so strongly contrasts a certain kind of Marxist reading of the way that labor congeals value in objects, and, uh, and this way that uh, our entity in action congeals value in persons, and in relationships between persons. It seems to contrast the material on the one hand to the intersubjective on the other. And it's that that I had, uh, I mean, I think if you're going to make such a contrast, then you must do so on more solid historical grounds, uh, rather than in the very general theoretical, philosophical grounds that he takes from our end. So it's more that distinction between the material and the intersubjective that I would disagree with. I would, I'm very interested in looking at the material composition of intersubjective relationships and their decomposition through processes of, of, of abstraction, which ironically makes, in Marx's account of labor, labor less material and more abstract. Right, so there's an irony, there's almost a flipping around that I think is going on. But so uh, what I would take away from that is more a sense of not wanting to keep such a sharp divide between the world of persons and the world of things, which as his starting point seems to read to me how he contrasts speech acts as directed towards the world of persons and production which is directed towards the world of things. I think it's that that's it's quite it's just it's it's the combination of these various theoretical scaffoldings that it's doing. Um, but I, I don't take issue at all with, uh, you know, I think I'm very sympathetic to what you were just outlining as a preferable way of reading communication. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks very much. I'm still trying to digest um, the argument. Have you seen that quote about saying not that marriage is in decline? I mean, you're accepting that, that, that some of the figures in the data show that, but, but that in fact you could read it as that partial marriages are proliferating. Um, and I'm just wondering, sort of empirically, um, to what extent marriages are also not actually happening. So that in addition to partial marriages and various beginnings that may or may not continue, um, actual the increase of non-marriage, as it were. And I'm, I'm, I don't know um, if you looked at Debbie Badlinder's, she did a study five or six years ago, um, and it was, she was, it was around to women's land rights and property rights in that context, and, and what happens and whether or not women are accessing land independently of marriage, etc. Et so in that context, and she did three, um, there were three, I can't remember the details, but there were some three quite large surveys in, in I think, Eastern Cape, 
and hated him and possibly knew him best. And finding quite significant differences, actually, which was also interesting between the three. Um, but kind of confirming that marriages, in addition to partial marriages and stuff, were not happening. So I'm just wondering if you can sort of comment um, on that um, and what, what the concept, if you would, if you accept that, then what, is the, what does that mean for your, the kind of social reorganization that you hint at, that you discussed at the beginning, but don't really explain what that might be beyond, as I'm understanding it, that people are attributing various misfortunes to incomplete or partial marriages. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there's a third part of the paper which needs to be added, which will look at the consequences of this from the distribution of children and the way in which, at, 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 at certain subsequent moments, abandoned relationships can be reactivated in order to, on the basis of payments having been made, or through the payments, making the payments then, in order to redistribute children between households. Um, so that will give perhaps more of a concreteness to this. Um, that said, I'm very much a qualitative ethnographer. I, I work only from a single case. So. So I'm very bad at the overall figures, and I, I, it's Thomas who's responsible for giving me the paper from which I drew those figures, in fact. Um, <laughs> um, now, Fiona said, I'm not sure whether I got it at the beginning, whether you were, you were yourself saying that the evidence is that marriages might in fact be happening much more than is evidence, or whether the evidence shows that they're not happening, which is in line with... Well, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the study properly, um, but it, it was certainly sh it was showing that marriage um, was in decline. That not that marriages were also not happening, not even yes. beginning. That the extent of marriage is not beginning. Of women, in fact, setting themselves up more autonomously um, with with their children or not with their children was on the increase. Um, so, in addition to also a lot of evidence, which which very quite interestingly enough, I'll have to go back and study between the different localities in terms of partial marriages. That you're describing, so the beginnings yeah. of that discussion, but also an actual increase. Um, yeah, no, look, I think that there's tremendous, even sub regional variation in this. Mark Hunter's new work um, is showing something which I very much don't see in rural Brazil and Italy, and so the uh, same with other people I've spoken to, which is near local cohabitation without rival payments and so on. So, increasingly, couples moving in together um, and organizing their relationships much more on the basis of common investments in children, things like school fees and so on rather than through these are final transactions and being able to live together on that basis. Um, I don't see that in rural communities in Brazil and Thailand at all. Um, this is Ke Northern Kesey, do Yeah, Northern Kesey. No, 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 no. The community, there are two communities where I've done extensive field work and they're both in Northern Brazil and Thailand. Um, so I think that there's variation in that. I think the question, though, this is a question Fiona raised when I gave a short version of this paper um, at our ESNA conference, which is to say we need to find out more precisely what's actually being asked in these studies. And given everything I've said, what does it mean to ask somebody whether they're married or not? And given everything we know from the literature on the complexity of that question ethnographically in Southern Africa, is that actually a, a question that's doing much work? And what is it hiding? What's, um, you know, there might be ways in which uh, the formal legal recognition of a marriage um, might be activated in land issues and so on. You know, so but you would have to disaggregate that from a much broader question of are you married? Um, I mean, Conrad famously says that the question are you married simply doesn't work in Swana marriage. And yet it's the question that we seem to be asking all over the place. Um, so I wonder about that, you know, and I wonder what's being hidden by, by that. My experience is that and this is anecdotal, it's not, it's based on ethnographic work, not in any systematic quantitative work. My experience is that the vast majority of people are not cohabiting um, in relationships with their partners, but have histories of a final transaction. Courtship has been done, gifts have been made, uh, Ithaola might have been paid, bride wealth, elements of bride wealth might have been paid, other courtships entered into, into all of their associated gifts, so there's a if you take any person as a starting point, this my experience is that most, if not all, people have very rich histories of beginning marriage, uh, without that leading in rural cases very much to cohabitation. Um, but with important consequences nonetheless, as I when I build this into the final version of the paper, it will be the distribution of children that I'm most interested in. I don't know if that really gets us. Well, I was asking what you 
that's from your area that you are studying. It's hard to so answer it. But as I recall, just again, that the Bible is studying, I, I, should, I should get. I mean, they were using, they were not just asking, well, are you married or not? There was quite a bit that um, they were working with various terminologies okay, that, were, right. that were in use yeah. uh, to understand people's the position the themselves. I'll just need to but it was important to go back to before you ask that, that I worked with Vicky Hosey while she was doing that work. I saw you smiling when you and, said that. And, and, and the, the methodological question still arises, so she was asking more complex types of questions, and yet it still presupposes a certain kind of response. So, well, do I situate myself in this, under this term or that term? It doesn't answer the question necessarily just to say, well, yeah, we're going to invent more categories that you can put yourself in. It doesn't solve the, the, inter the Problem of the interview to say, well, I'm going to ask you to, to put yourself in the box. Well, oh, maybe I've started, but what does that really mean? And it, 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 you know, it quickly falls into the kinds of questions you're asking. So I think the demographers are struggling with this in their own way. Nikki is one of the better demographers who's very sensitive to the kinds of questions you're asking. So and I think even Mark the Hunter does that to some extent because he talks about these kinds of relationships in this kind of relation. And it's true that there's, there's this. In moral discourse, there's this architecture of relationship, but how any one person can put themselves into that is constantly being negotiated and can shift retrospectively and prospectively, and, and it's very complex. So, yeah. Uh, yeah thank you. And, uh, and the final section, I think, is going to be very interesting. I'm looking forward to the one about the, about the distribution of children you mentioned. I'm curious, I mean, I'm really taken by the idea of the partial connection and proliferation of partial connection. Um, but I guess I had two questions around that, which is um, which is one about the kind of specificity of the partial connection. In some ways, of course, uh, at least one can imagine all sorts of partial connections that earlier in the work spoke about different, different stages of part transaction and, and so on. So, um, so when we talk about the proliferation of partial connections, is that is that just a way of talking about the, uh, the fact that less marriages are being completed, or, or, or could could we also could we assume the other side, which is that that there may be many partial connections incomplete, I mean, given what you said about how uh, often it's never really complete. But I mean, the the idea of partial connection is is there something? Are we sure that it's, that it's as linked to the to the decline of marriage as, 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 as seems to be, as, as you seem to be assuming in the, in, in the beginning of the paper. So that's the one side. The other side is I'm kind of curious to hear more about the recognition of the partial connection, right? Um, I mean, the partial connection is such a productive concept, um, and it, it seems like it could imply all sorts of uh, intimacies um, and all sorts of gifts that get, that get classified in certain kinds of ways, as you said, re retrospectively. When it, Useful or bizarre. Um, but the, the various modes of recognition of the partial connection, uh, I'd like to hear more about it. You gave some, you gave some sense of it, but a bit more on it, maybe. Okay. Um, the first question perhaps proliferation is not the right word. I mean, what I'm meaning to do is to contrast this to this narrative of decline. Sure. That uh, alongside that or beneath that. They've been, in fact, very extensive the final connections. Um, and that's, I feel like, like we, we're overlooking that um, through this narrative of the decline of marriage, as, as much as it might be true in its own, in its own way. Um, so I don't mean to imply I wouldn't have the kind of demographic material to, to be able to answer the question of whether it's actually increasing. And that's the kind of work that Mark does very well. But I, 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 I don't know how, how we go about doing that. Um, the question of recognition, well, there are many, there are many arenas of recognition. There are um, the, the ones that I've been most interested in have to do, because of my interest in questions to do with ancestors, have to do with divination um, and with uh, the ways in which histories of transaction are brought to bear in the diagnosis of misfortune, because I have. This is one of the ways in which I concentrate on. But there are many other domains as well, there are family councils. Um, there are the uh, the very careful recollection at each phase of what has gone before and how it should be understood. 
and the, and the very careful specification of what should come. So there's a constantly, it's a constantly moving target, but it's a target, right? There's very careful, during, broadly speaking, that's called a bright wealth negotiations, they're much wider than that. But during negotiations between sets of, sets of representatives of airlines, there's a, there's a very specific, specified assessment that's being made of what's, what has been given and what has not been given and what's required and what should be coming in the future. Um, and I've done a lot of ethnographic observation of that as well, transcriptions of those kinds of conversations. Um, so that uh, I get more time to write this out in book formats, that will be something I'll be looking at there as well. Um, it's very interesting that, uh, and this is something I've also written about in another way recently, it's very interesting that um, although there's certain standard guidelines, families differ quite, quite markedly in what they take as familial custom. There's, there's a very common expression, this is the last fine, that uh, so this is not one thing, it doesn't resemble itself. Um, and that, uh, depending, you know, and this is motivated by the idea of what the dead of that family would recognize as effective action, what it is that they need to see and hear and smell being done and so on. I can just follow that. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm curious as well about the way the partial connection might at particular times be deemed legitimate and not legitimate, particularly given the, the sort of story of misfortune and, the, and, and correction that you've told us about a lot. But at other moments, the kind of moral sanction for a particular relationship or a particular gift as, yeah, yeah. As, as part of a transactionally sort of cycle or at the beginning uh, or at other times, uh, this has been deemed a kind of connection that's illegitimate that, that cannot start. Yeah. No, I, mean, I think. Yeah. It goes back to what I was saying about the the sense of legitimacy being attached to the sense that things are in motion, ongoing. Right? So it's not just where you are in the process, but also in a sense that that process is continuing, that it has energy to it. And uh, misfortune, obviously, is one way of interrupting that and bringing bringing things much more into question. Questions? We don't want the conversation to be dominated by this side of the room. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have a, a question. It's not a big one, it's a very small one. Um, and it's, it's I'm not even sure how, how to phrase it really, but um, are the dead as powerful as they were? As, Having the capacity to diagnose and spot, and it's a hard question. I mean, you could, but let's just say, in your, is there a kind of history, kind of my intuition from, to it? My intuition from reading all the material is that there have been radical transformations. In, I don't know if I want to speak about so much about the power of the dead, but rather. Something that's, that struck me at any rate is the question of which dead um, have agency and are, and are heard. I mean, when you read the classical ethnographies, the, the, the dead that are listened to are those who've achieved the fullness of ancestorhood. They're men, they're, um, they're old, they, they had grandchildren before they died, they, you know, they, and so on and so on. I don't know whether this is an artifact of something just being left out of the old ethnography, or whether it's, which doesn't quite sound right to me, um, or at least wouldn't be enough of an explanation, or whether it's because there is a historical shift, which I think is, is probably an issue. In a lot of my um, ethnographic material, there are many kinds of people who are at issue when you're, when you're addressing the dead and when the dead are worrying people. So. Um, it's very commonly the case that if someone, if a young man is going through, or a young woman is going through a life passage ritual, uh, his or her siblings might come to bother the process because they're jealous that it wasn't done for them, that they died before their time, and that they're not going through this. So the young also now um, engage. I, one case which I think I mentioned to Fiona in the past, or um, I recorded a case of a, um, a man who was himself a Samoa. Um, whose unborn child um, came to demand a name because 
hadn't been given a name because it was miscarried um, and came back to demand a name. So that's ancestors have not even been born. Um, so I, and I, you did, the, the, the absolute absence of this from any of the old literature is very striking. And I, you know, my intuition is that there's been a, um, a redistribution of agency to, to other kinds of care uh, in the course of the 20th century, but it's an intuition. Hi. Um, so I think basically uh, talking back to your agency of the dead, who has agency. If uh, earlier you were saying that uh, the ancestors have criteria for marriages, and that if those, those particular criteria aren't carried through, then the ancestors don't need to be required for marriage. But what happens now with an, the new generation dying and then having their own criteria? Can the criteria not be changing? And so so marriages criteria in real life then you change. This is one of the main themes of the book I'm working on, which is that even if they've lived in historical time, and this is quite unlike what you see in literature from Madagascar, for instance, where the dead have very specific historical periodizations. Um, my sense of things, and again, this is just based on my own ethnographic fieldwork, I'm sure there might be many exceptions to this, but my sense of things is that as they're addressed through ritual action, the dead lose biography. So they start off with a lot of biography. Um, you know, that they, they died in particular ways and the issues with that, and uh, they suffered particular things or left particular work unfinished, and there's issues with that, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and there, there are ways in which they do retain some, like, you know, people might leave particular gifts like tobacco or marijuana or, which are, or one, of, one or the other of these because they know that this person liked that. <laughs> but my sense is that there's a kind of smoothing out into the generic figure of the ancestor, almost disappears into pre-colonial time. Um, and I think that, uh, that's, that, that, that's, um, that that's something that struck me in my work. So that, uh, that becomes less and less, the specificity of a person's biography becomes less and less important as time goes on. So then could there be a change of marriage culture then? Um, or is it sort of an idea then that this culture is fixed, it's the idea that's fixed, but the ground level is changing? Well, it's that the way people get around this is to add rather than to change, to proliferate ceremonies, to do things in a, in a number of ways. Uh, over a few days or over months or whatever, you know, to, to, to make sure that uh, everything is taken account of, including what's being demanded here. So, I mean, you just now you spoke about um, the, the kind of shifting grounds of, of the, um, how a household is being constituted and, and, and therefore how a, how a kinship is being realized. So, so I mean, my research is very close to where you think your field work, and, and um, thinking about how women are, in, in my context are, are performing marriage processes with other women, uh, for me was uh, very revealing of the ways in which uh, um, there, there might be an available set of materials with which to do various kinds of things. Um, and so gender, generation, Etc. can be researched in many kinds of permutations. So, so um, I I would agree with your intuition that there's a kind of um, um, uh, like a capacity for recalibration, prospectively and retrospectively around uh, distribution and redistributions of obligations, of rights, of children, especially. But that. Um, it seems that a lot of the evidence is putting pressure more on, on, on our received notions, which is what I hear you to be also trying to say. We need to rethink what are, what are the categories that we bring to bear on this very complex and very important situation. So, so it's not only what is marriage and what is an ancestor that comes under pressure, but also then what, what we think, the kinds of persons that we think are at stake, whether they are so called men or women or Quenya. Man, young woman, uh, brother in law, uncle, etc. All of those terms become much more slippery than, than what we thought they were. So, um, 
terms of um, the cycle decline, um, the two obvious sort of anchors for that seem to me the one, the kind of moral panic around um, uh, various kinds of uh, social formations around the country, whether it's a church or bourgeois middle class kind of values, um, but also a kind of biopolitical concern. So, Vicky Hosewood in that same paper they note that, and a number of other writings, that in fact fertility has been declining for well, since the 1950s, in fact, mm -hmm. well, for a bit longer than that. So, uh, they're actually predating apartheid. So, so in, so in addition to, so, so this question about what's the relation between marriage on the one hand and social order and, say, reproduction, mm -hmm. the democracy they have one particular kind of access through that, and um, say the state or the church, etc., have other. Different kinds of routes through the same problem. So, so I'm wondering where we could, where we where we might go with this um, with the critique in terms of uh, being able to say, well, uh, actually, you can't say that there's decline. Or, or the quantitative exactly is in question, given that um, new kinds of relations can be re refigured quite creatively all the time. So. Uh, so I'm just wondering where where it places the, the, the one one aspect of your critique, which is that um, the, the people are not able to say it's complete, right? Uh, um, so people are so many people you're talking about are initiating, but but behind that stands a kind of shadow of well they would like to complete but they can't, right? Mm -hmm. So so. I'm, I'm worried about the, the, the kind of um, the, the teleology of, of, of uh, yeah, in the sense of so are we going to a place where we say, well, there's a kind of uh, deep alienation at its heart of the, the, the means are, are relatively out of reach for, for these projects? Or are we able to say, well, uh, in fact, relatedness can be, can be restitched uh, according to the demands of the moment? Well, I think there's a complex historical relationship between both of those. I don't think it's one or the other. Um, I mean, I think the interesting question, and Michael Yarbrough's work addresses this really brilliantly, is the, the question of you know, what's going to happen in the next few years as legal change, um, well, and, and, and against the backdrop of legal change, to what extent is the state going to assimilate um, the ability to, to create these relationships into itself? Um, and become the author of these relationships versus people's own ritual attempts. So, you know, Lambert contrasts this in his piece from a ritual and a post ritual into a ritual and a post ritual moment, and questions whether we would head into a post ritual moment in South Africa when the state becomes the author of marriage um, rather than people's own interactions and performances. Um, and if that were the case, then the question would become a lot simpler. Um, but uh, I, don't see, I don't see immediate evidence of that happening. Um, so, although there is estrangement from the ability to complete processes, the sense is still that were such a process to happen, it would come from people's own performances rather than from the, the recognition by the state. Which takes us back to the question that you raised earlier on around the question of audience. So how do you constitute an audience? So I've just written a paper saying that you know, the, the literature on customary law in focusing on the, the formal authority of chiefs really overlooks a huge range of uh, audiences for customary law, including the divination. Um, so, so in constituting, so when the dead are constituted as an audience, and this is what Michelle's question is kind of gesturing to, that, that perhaps that audience might be constituted or yeah, evinced in different ways, mm -hmm. and so therefore it might want to hear differently, or it might speak differently. Mm -hmm. So when there's a cattle are speaking, uh, are they saying the same thing now as they've always said? Uh, and so, or might they speak differently? In sense? Well, we know that the requirements for marriage payments don't just vary family to family, they varied over time. I mean, I was citing uh, Mark Hunter's, um, who just makes a one sentence uh, comment on this, but that's uh, it's easily a 20th century innovation. That uh, they, they were put in place so as to circumvent the Shepstonian limits right off. That you can only transfer up to 11 cattle. Well, when people wanted more, they began to pile on other kinds of gifts that don't have the same kind of formal legal status. 
but are very much a part of people's assessments of whether they're married or not and to what extent and so on, what's been done and what needs to be done. So we know that this changes over time, but I'm not sure that that captures the, uh, the system of relationships and practices that's an issue there. You know, which um, effaces that historical change in ways that I think we should also pay attention to and not just see as some kind of historical false consciousness or something, right? Um, but rather pay more serious attention to the construction of temporality within these within these actions and not just around them by history. I think is also important. Is it asking for me for what? For me, it's an interesting theoretical question, <laughs> but I guess that's my, my main concern with it. Um, elaborate a bit, but what, what do you think it might be important for? Well, that's, I mean, I'm coming from people differently feel. I'm now interested in persons of historical change, social change, and basically. See change where you see not necessarily continuity, but um, I'm not sure what you know. It seems to me you are stressing. I don't know if continuity is the right word, but, but con continuation, reinterpretation, um, and various fluidities. Whereas I would be I'm looking, I'm seeing, imagining, projecting mm -hmm. um, um, quite significant social changes in various institutions, relationships, gender roles. Etc. You know, whereas, so that I'm trying to ask, you know, you're just saying it is important. Um, it's, you know, what, what do you see as it? What are the, what are, what are the important implications? Um, I think uh, social relationships and social organization that you are. Yeah. So I think an ethnographic rendering of those relationships would have to take account of their internal representation, their internal self representation. Um, and that, that's not the only way to talk about such relationships, of course, right? I mean, one can talk about them from a completely externalist point of view as well and, and learn a lot from that. But I think the specificity of an ethnographic approach to those relationships would have to, while historically contextualizing, also put a lot of emphasis on the internal appearance, the manifestation of those relationships to their participants. Which are changing. Yes, yes, but um, but the question is whether that sense that they are changing is part of people's consciousness of them, and that's where I would say that it's it's a little bit more ambiguous. And I don't know if it's enough just to say, well, they're wrong, because <laughs> we can show the past change. There's something to that. There's something interesting about that sense that uh, change is not taking place. That things are ancestral. So I guess it's important in that sense. So this is what people mean by tradition, right? Yeah, I mean, and I think you, then you have to you have to specify very carefully because we've gone through a long period of deconstructing the notion of tradition, right? I think you know what's what's become more interesting in recent anthropological work is the um, the way in which particular uh, systems of tradition are actually constituted. Um, and, th and that might be a lot more complex than, than the old stories used to suggest. I think it's a lot of science work, for instance, and others. But you might also raise the stakes uh, from the point of index indexing the human, where we're also trying to get really understand uh, Social scientific uh, descriptions of, say, custom have had huge political implications in this part of the world. So it does make a difference. Uh, it's important that we put pressure on these terms because, uh, you know, some guy with Hilton White, his description of these processes does actually have a, a real force in the world. Uh, this anthropological description has a life of its own, in a sense. Um, 
and you talk about Shepston, but from Shepston until the 21st century, we've had any number of uh, bureaucratic uptake of, of exactly this kind of social scientific claims. So um, I think these things do have a force. I, I, some of my work in the two to is a area of thinking too of, of your history, but um, it's, right now in the, in the Solana Mabasa um, area, there are intense disputations going on right now about who is a member of the Mabasa land claim, which has everything to do with how you figure these configure these relationships. So, so whatever the land claims commission at that time decided around the, the, the settlement of that claim, it's those um, re, re, refigurations of relatedness are, are ricocheting all across that landscape right now, and having massive effects. So, in a sense, I think the stakes are quite high for for uh, interrogating very closely both the empirical question of, of I would say, who's practicing what, but also how we think about that. So, as part for me, as part of the the, um, the reward of this index in the human. The framework through which we're thinking, which is to say that the production of knowledge of, of these kinds of practices uh, is, is part of a, of a larger problematic around um, the conditions of, of the production of knowledge of who we are. We're sitting here in Stellenbosch, we can be the mountains, and, and we're having a debate uh, right now about language and about transformation. These things are all, uh, to put it in the, uh, to put it into, into circulation with the sort of land based analysis, these are all. Conditioning the, the 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 ways in which we might speak about anthropology in general, or about kinship in particular, or about uh, um, we imagine these people are South Africans in one instance, or, or um, members of some kind of Zulu uh, ethnic identification project, or even in one president Tal increasingly uh, with, um, splintering that Zulu identification project. So this actually matters, I think, at many levels. Beyond your own theoretical fancies. No, I mean, I completely agree with that. My hesitation is in another direction. It's more that In the wake of work by Mangani and others, I think we have a very established uh, narrative of what the politics of custom are. And although it's not untrue, I think it's a very narrow narrative. Um, and that it leaves out of sight. Uh, it, it gives extraordinary privilege to the state in the construction of social process. Um, and I'm not convinced that that's entirely uh, Warranted. It's not that it's untrue, it's just a question of to what extent is it doing, to what extent is that what's happening and not other things. Um, so it's not a critique of the argument, it's a critique of the scope of the argument, which I think has uh, you know, really colonized our understanding of the politics of culture. Um, and uh, I, so I guess as a reaction to that, my instinct is always to from very partial ethnographic stories to probe beneath the general for the point of critique um, that uh, tries to unsettle some of the established narratives. And uh, within the social sciences, I think, I mean, at this point, and particularly within African studies, the narrative of the colonial construction of custom is orthodoxy. Um, it's, not, it's not a critical point anymore. Doesn't have critical purchases. You're not telling anyone anything in particular by saying that now. It's accepted as the so the question is well, what interesting and enlightening intellectual work can we do now to and uh, my sense is that there's a politics of culture and a, a a construction of social relations in relation to questions of culture as ethics that's uh, tremendously important in many South African communities which is completely elided by that discourse. Um, so that's my hesitation. It's not a critique of that discourse. <coughs> it's a critique of its scope, that there's a lot that's being ignored because of that. Um, so that's my, that's my hesitation. That's partly why we've 
I think, felt the need to raise a project like Index and Humans to say, well, there is still a scope for doing some kind of thing that we might call anthropology in this place and time, in the face of uh, many cancellations of any kind of ethnographic project. Mm -hmm. So you have to be right. I'm glad that you stated it explicitly like that, because in a way, part of what we say, sitting here at Stellenbosch, we do need to say that in order to move to some other kind of project. So it's not that we don't say it anymore. We can't say it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think what you're about saying is re really crucial. I mean, some of us were at UCT, the big project of keywords, for example, ends up being orthodox. Mondani text approved. I mean, it's fail, it starts with you know, Vale and the whole and range and Hotspur, and then it's, it becomes orthodoxy that culture is constructed. And therefore, we can short circuit you know, the kind of ethnographic work that you're doing because you already understand the contours of the customer. So how, I mean, I think it's a big problem. It's a, a style of thinking, actually, that one needs to think through quite carefully. And the constructionist moment was perhaps not over. So the idea is if you can show something that's historically constructed, you've done the work. Um, you, you don't actually need to go where you go. So I'm trying to think, how does that style of thinking shape intellectual projects beyond anthropology, beyond marriage, you know, customs, so that the short-circuiting of the kind of work that you were proposing. Yeah, That's I mean, I was struck in fieldwork in 2009, there was and I think it's because it was because of the, the rise of the ANC over previous years in in discussions about the culture in the province and the, the contestation of older IFP narratives about culture. But so uh, there was a lot of discussion going on about the colonial invasion of custom going on within communities. Um, what some, something people were constantly coming back to was that uh, the uh, we were sort of joking about women were often joking about the fact that thank God for the white people because otherwise we wouldn't get this one cow. Right, so that's the mother's cow of the eleven, right? There's ten plus one, and the one is for the woman, and it's a Shepstonian innovation. Thank God for Shepston, right? Um, that joking is on a completely separate path from the insistence on the role of the mother's animal as tradition. The two discourses just don't collide, um, and that's because they're taking place in different domains of practice and speech. There's an institutional reason for that. Um, you know, we know people can often hold two conflicting opinions, right? But this was a very dramatic instantiation of that. Um, but I think it points to something important, and you're not going to get rid of that second one by insisting on the first. You know, by insisting on the colonial construction of custom. You're not going to eliminate the, the peculiar efficacy of that term and the way in which people self-consciously related to the construction of action and so on and so on. So yeah, I agree. I have a question that's um, completely at a slant to this conversation, so we don't need to take it if you want to carry on. The question really hinges around something um, that materializes in the ethnographic work around metrical county and the partiality or unfinishedness of, of transfers. And it makes me wonder about the status of matrilineal kin as ethical forebears. And I wondered if you'd like to just talk a little bit about what matrilineal capital means in relation to, to multiple sets of, of ancestral ancestry. So what comes, I don't know if it's exactly addresses that, but what comes to mind immediately is um, the fact that, again, I have many, sto I've collected many stories of uh, matrilineal or other ancestors through female lines, through female points of connection, if not matrilineality, but so through female points of connection. Um, playing roles in people's lives that uh, really complicate the narrative that ancestors are agnatic. And, uh, so, and I think that that needs to be written much more carefully into the way we think about things. And again, it would be interesting to see if that has some historical, and I don't, I don't have evidence for that one way or the other, although my intuition is that's, you know, there might be something of a historical structure going on. 
I also think this has to do with the privatization of ancestry and its relocation into the domestic sphere rather than the political domain, um, which is obviously something that so Adam Ashford has briefly written about and other people have done as well. One or two more last questions, wherever. Yeah, I think we've had a lot of, um, there's a lot of material that you've given us, a lot of um, big concepts, big theories that um, uh, the front, you know, we're all kind of grappling with, but also rich descriptions. So um, the challenge for us is to think with your material but into very different kinds of places and spaces. So, thinking of Fiona's work with others in Cape Town, the natural faculty has a very particular section. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and even in Positive Town, where, where we both have our field work, where there are many publics, like many culture publics, uh, not all of you, well, many of them take up notions of custom in very different ways, and, and some of them uh, don't speak the language of custom at all. So, so there's, there's a clear a plethora of Available speech forms, um, of contested uh, forms of action. And, uh, um, so the challenge for us is to pay attention to them methodologically, but also to think critically with them about. So you've given us a fabulous um, sort of materials to work with, and we're going to continue discussing them momentarily. But thank you so much for coming down to Stellarbosch and for yeah, for bringing your brilliant ideas. Thank you, thank you very much.